It is the Christmas season, and in order to understand Christmas, uh, it sure helps to understand a little bit more of the Old Testament, and in particular, the, the life of the prophets and their teaching, but not just the prophets, but the whole story of God on, uh, on earth. And so we're going to dig into that in just a second, but to give you kind of a taste for uh, what it meant to interact with a prophet, just kind of imagine for a second, if somebody came up to you and said, God is not pleased with how you've been spending your weekends. And because of that, you're going to experience financial ruin for two years. But after those two years, if you turn back to God and you, and you start doing what God would want even on the weekends, then after those two years, you're going to meet a woman who will give you enough money to bring you back to financial stability and even more money than that for you will forever be financially set for the rest of your life. And then 2.2 years later, you look back and you say, that all happened. That happened. Like the bottom dropped out. I lost all my money. I lost every, every ability and my credit just went horribly wrong. But after two years of suffering and barely making it by, I met a woman who gave me enough money to bring me back to stability and even more money and enough to be financially set for the rest of my life. And those years went by and I realized that person that told me that was right. What would you think of that person? <laughs> like, doo, 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 right? <laughs> like, Dude, that's weird, right? <laughs> like, that's a strange person, right? How would they have that kind of insight? That's a little taste of what it was like to encounter one of these prophets of old that you have also in the New Testament, but especially when we talk about the prophets in the Bible, we're thinking about those prophets uh, from roughly 800 B.C. to roughly 400 B.C. You've got a, a number of hundreds of years there where different prophets were speaking and acting in such a way that then some of what they said got recorded down and written down and passed down throughout the centuries. And so when we say the prophets, that's usually what we mean. The prophets spoke a word for the now. So at that time when they would say, here's what God thinks. It wasn't typically like, God's mad at what you're doing over the weekends. It was bigger than that and kind of an all-encompassing thing where they would say, look, your life is not right. You're not doing right. You've got to turn back to the Lord. And if you don't, here's the horrible thing that's going to happen to you or to your country and so forth. So there was a word for the, the right then, but there was also this later on kind of prediction that usually encompassed something like the wrath of God, the punishment of God, those things. But it never was left just there with the punishment. There would be this hope of restoration and reconciliation because God's always long-suffering, trying to reach out and forgive and restore. That later would sometimes even involve the idea of a Messiah coming, a person from God that would set things right in a messianic age and kingdom where things would be better. That's a bit of what we just heard the choir singing about and that kind of peace on earth kind of an experience where even though we're still fighting the darkness now, you can still have that sustaining peace because now with the coming of Jesus, the Messiah, we have that messianic kingdom now more fully than we ever did back then. So that's a little preview of where we're going in terms of with the prophets. But for just a second to kind of understand the prophets, I want to give you that background of the whole history of Israel. So in just a few minutes, I want to cover the entire Old Testament. And you're like, sweet, now I don't have to read that whole Old Testament because it's long and the names are weird and it's, it just takes forever. So here's a little summary of that in case this is new to you. The beginning of the Bible, we find that God created the whole earth, heavens, earth, everything that has been created was created by God through that word of God and that creative power of God. So that means that all people then had God as their God initially, but as they moved and spread out over the world, they started to lose their understanding of God. And so they started being kind of clouded in their understanding and, and they, they started making up different ideas of God and different numbers of God. And maybe God's in the sea, maybe God's in this tree, maybe God's in the deer, so forth. You start worshiping little images they would create. And that happened all, all over the place, all over the world. So we started moving away from God. So that God chooses this guy and his wife to then have a, a unique relationship with them to try to set things straight. It's not a real efficient way to go. Here's this one family, and then we're going to try to have them bless the whole earth. But God's more 
un- unfolding this beautiful story of, of history in God's way, in God's time. And so those people were Abraham and Sarah. So they move away from their people. They move toward the promised land. We'll call that Canaan. Eventually it's going to be called Israel. And the map up there on the left is that land. Now, to situate it, the, the, the body of water is the Mediterranean Sea. That means Egypt is down to your left if you're looking at it. And it means that Greece and Italy are up to the left. And then off to the right would be Asia. And you've got the rest of the Middle East. Does that make sense? Roughly? Okay. Why is it different colors? Because those are the different tribes. Now, where do we get the tribes? Well, Abraham had a son, and then he had a son, and that son, the grandson of Abraham, was Jacob, but his name was changed by God to Israel. So it was his literal name. Then he had 12 sons, so it was the 12 tribes of Israel. So the different colors then are the, the, the places that as they entered the promised land, they were given little bits of land by God through what Moses said and then what Joshua, Joshua was the successor of Moses. So where did Moses come into picture? Remember the 12 tribes, all their ancestors were in Egypt. They were enslaved and then they were led out of Egypt by Moses. In the wilderness, they were given the laws, the law of Moses, really important covenantal relationship with God. One God with all these expectations, follow that God, be a witness to the people. So then Joshua led them into the promised land, Canaan. Then it becomes called Israel because those are all the descendants of Israel. They've got the 12 tribes. They divide it all up. They're ruled first by judges. The judge was like a priest and a king together in one person. But the people said, no, that's not good enough. We want kings like everybody else has. So God gave them kings. Saul, David, Solomon. After Solomon, though, you remember what happened then? Civil war. Because Solomon's heart started going toward these foreign gods. The people were led astray. The punishment of God came and God allowed them to fight each other and they broke apart. Northern kingdom of Israel, southern kingdom of Judah. Terrible, terrible. And so in that time then, now you've got more and more kings that don't always follow God. And actually the majority of them do not follow God very well. So that's when God raises up prophets where there had been prophets of old, but now it's like this epidemic of morality and spirituality. So God sends prophet after prophet to talk to the kings of of the different kingdoms and to try to bring them back. So the message then oftentimes was repent. You remember that from last week if you were here. It's like you're driving down the road, (laughs) turning, turning away from that disaster, repenting, coming back. And so that's, that's the general idea of where we're going. So you would try to turn back, try to repent. And it, then in the scriptures then, as you start looking at what the prophets said, and it wasn't just about what they said, but sometimes it was also about what they did. God would ask them to do something that would be similar to what they were preaching. So in the book of Hosea, we read these words. Hosea chapter 1. It's a real prophet back in that that time period that we were talking about, when the Lord first began speaking to Israel through Hosea, he said to him, go and marry a prostitute. <laughs> I would be like, time out. I don't think so. Not good. Like, I, I want somebody that's going to be faithful just to me. But God says to Hosea, go marry a prostitute so that some of her children will be conceived in prostitution. This will illustrate how Israel has acted like a prostitute by turning against the Lord and worshiping other gods. The New Testament authors, when they talk about the prophets of old in the Old Testament, there is a reverence there because they realize these folks had it rough sometimes. I mean, at one point, one of them is asked to walk around month after month after month preaching nude, (laughs) stripped down, warning the people, getting the people's attention. I mean, that's just bizarre. Another prophet was asked to, day after day, cook his food over dung. That's poo, Mark. I mean, I know what you're saying, but you know what I mean, right? Like, now, can you imagine using dung in your smoker? Like, the aftertaste is not to be desired, right? What are we talking about? We're talking about people that were trying to communicate to the most powerful people in the world, of their world, how bad things were getting to try to wake them up and God's put it upon their heart. And so sometimes they had to be extreme, And then the people didn't always receive that well. And 
So I think it's in the book of Hebrews where they're talking about some of those prophets, and they were even sawed in two. I mean, they would do horrible things to these people. Same thing happened in some of the Middle Ages when there were some really great Christians doing really good things, and the, the people that call themselves the church and tr- call themselves Christians would do horrible things to them because they didn't like the fact that they were being called out, that they weren't doing what they should be doing. It's like, no, I'm going to shut you up, so I'm going to throw you in jail, or I'm going to boil you in oil, or I'm going to tar and feather you, or I'm going to crucify you, or I'm going to crucify you upside down, or I'm going to cut your head off, or I'm going to sell you in two. I mean, we're talking real things, right? You know, you know history. Like, this, is, this really happened to these people that were trying to just do what God wanted them to do and say the right things. So then God allows some of the horrible things that the prophets said to actually happen. So the prophets would come to them and say, look, Kings and people in power, you're, you're sinning against the Lord. You're, you're worshiping other gods. You're worshiping money. You just care about yourself. You're oppressing people. So God's going to allow locusts to come in. God's going to allow famine. God's going to allow a drought. God's going to allow a horrible fire. Uh, God's going to allow disease. God's going to allow other invaders to come in and take over your land. And they would predict these things over a period of time. And then maybe the prophet would still be alive or maybe they'd die, but those things would happen. And the people would be like, oh my gosh, we should have turned, we should have repented. Now, why is it important to realize that? Well, it's important to realize that because when Jesus came and preached and then died and rose from the dead, it so shook the Jewish mindset and those people of that day who had the history of the prophets, it so got through to them, oh my goodness, this guy took on the punishment that we deserve. So I have a, a picture of kind of a, a, a red state of people where they are just kind of like in agony. And that represents the punishment that are on the people. Okay, so again, you're looking at the prophets and you find that, um, that horrible things would happen to them. They would suffer, not because God wants it that way, but because they've stepped out of relationship with God. And so that horrible thing would happen. But the, the prophets would then prophesy that eventually it's going to get better. Eventually God will relent and will heal and reconcile if you will turn back. Jesus then, it turns out as he fulfills prophecy, he takes on himself that which the prophets had predicted would happen to people in general when they moved away from God and sinned. He takes on himself the punishment. He takes on himself the guilt, the shame, all that is negative. He takes it on himself for us. That shook the people's minds and it kind of awakened them to say God loves us so much that even upon his own son, upon himself, upon his word in the flesh, he would take that upon himself so that we could be fully restored and forgiven. That's part of the the story then of the prophets. So then if we move then to the idea of Malachi. Malachi starts off in chapter 4 saying, the Lord of heaven's armies says, the day of judgment is coming, burning like a furnace. On that day, the arrogant and the wicked will be burned up like straw. So you don't want to be arrogant and wicked, right? I mean, this is horrible, horrible, horrible. So it's kind of foretelling kind of the end of days, end of time, you know, totally you know, separating us all out. Where, where are we with God? They will be consumed, it says. But before that happens, look, Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. Look, I am sending you the prophet Elijah before the great and dreadful day of the Lord arrives. His preaching will turn the hearts of fathers to their children, and the hearts of children to their fathers. The coming of Elijah, the prophet Elijah. Hmm. That's a strange prophecy, because the prophet Elijah, by this point in Malachi's life, and here we're approaching 400 B.C., but Elijah lived hundreds of years before that. What what is he talking about? Well, Jesus, and then the, the writers of the New Testament, later they realize, wait, John the Baptist came proclaiming that we needed to turn back and repent and be baptized for the repentance of our sin and and just turning from that forgiveness completely. He prepared the way for Jesus to come and who was the Messiah. John the Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah. He was the one. He was the fulfillment of this very prophecy that they had sat with for 400 years saying, when's this going to happen? Another prophecy. 
fulfilled. Micah 5, 2, chapter 5, verse 2 of Micah. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you are small among the clans of Judah and among the families of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are of old from ancient times. Hmm. Out of Bethlehem. Where was Jesus born? I give the easiest quizzes in the world. Good job. Born in Bethlehem. Why did, why did, was that important? Well, the, the folks, the, the Jews that look back into their prophets, they realize, oh my goodness, for a long time this has been sitting here that somehow out of Bethlehem would come our hope and the ruler over of all of Israel. And oh my goodness. Hosea chapter 11, another prophet of that time period. Chapter 11, verse 1. When Israel was a child, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. Another Bible quiz. It's going to be an easy one. (laughs) Baby Jesus was born in what town? King Herod, local king of that area who was like a puppet for the Romans. Did not like the idea of another king being born (laughs) because he's going to lose his power and position. So he sent an army in to try to kill any kid under the age of two in in that little village. So Jesus' family fled to what country? There you go. Hundreds of years before, it's a part of the stories of the prophets. It may have had an, an application right at that time, but it also had this kind of foreshadowing effect that out of Egypt somehow that son would be called from God. Zechariah 9, 9. Rejoice, O people of Zion! Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem! Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. <laughs> Another pop quiz. When Jesus was riding into Jerusalem to be tried and convicted wrongly and die for our sins, he rode on a donkey's colt. There you go. Isn't that interesting? Connection, 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 connection. Stay in the book of Zechariah here for a minute. Chapter 11, verses 12 to 13. I told them, If you think it best, give me my pay. But if not, keep it. So they paid me 30 pieces of silver. And the Lord said to me, Throw it to the potter, the handsome price at which they valued me. Now who in the world, out there in the world, would be only worth 30 pieces of silver? I mean, I don't care how mad my parents were at me. I don't think they would have sold me for 30 pieces of silver. It would have had to have been gold or platinum or something like that, right? No. (laughs) No, they probably would not sell me, right? But who was sold out for 30 pieces of silver when Judas wanted to tell people where Jesus was and kind of speed up this messianic kingdom or maybe betray Jesus. We don't know exactly what his his motives were. It was Judas for 30 pieces of silver. The people said, hey, we'll pay you. Lead us to him. Let's arrest him now and we want to kill him. There it was in Zechariah all along. Zechariah 12, 10. I will pour out on the house of David. The house doesn't mean literal house. It means like the ancestors, the family of that King David who was anointed of God, kind of the best king that Israel had ever had, on his descendants, and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, a spirit of grace and supplication. They will look on me, the one they have, what? Pierced. The one they have pierced. And they will mourn for him as one mourns for an only child, and grieve bitterly for him as one grieves for a firstborn son. John 3.16, for whoever believes in him, not perish, right? Who's the one? He's the one that is said to be the only begotten son of God. The begotten son. And he was pierced. He was nailed to the cross. But it was through grace and and asking God's forgiveness for the people. Even when he was hanging there, he supplicated. He said, God, forgive them. Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. Zechariah 13, 1. On that day, a fountain will be opened for the dynasty of David. And for the people of Jerusalem, a fountain to cleanse them from all their sins and impurity. Another easy quiz. How many of us need to be cleansed of wrongdoing, sin, because we've done wrong things and we've sinned before? How many of us need to be cleansed of that, forgiven of that? 
You can at least raise your hands in your own mind. Yeah, we do. Who did that? Jesus. Micah 4.3. The Lord will mediate between peoples and will settle disputes between strong nations far away. They will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will no longer fight against nation nor train for war anymore. Jesus is teaching his life, his death, his resurrection, the giving of his spirit was meant to bring about a lifestyle that would look like that. He didn't say, they will know you are my disciples by how big your sword is and how sharp it is and how many people you kill with it. Right? That was not his message. He said, they will know you are my disciples by the love that you show for one another. Right? Powerful image. Um, there's an artist out there that's, that's making different pieces of art out of um, uh, guns and assault rifles and those types of things. Maybe the same person, but I think there's a different person who's making literal uh, garden tools out of those things, trying to remind people that when the love of Christ comes upon us, that it should change us from the inside out because we're now participating in going toward this new heaven and new earth. We're, we're not going to fight like that anymore. We're going to love one another. The early Christians started loving each other so much that there was a, a pagan whose letter we still have who says they even care about other people's poor. <laughs> they were like, this doesn't make any sense. The Christians not only care just about themselves and their own family members and stuff, but then they're like, oh, wait, they don't believe like I do and they don't speak my language, but I care about them. I'm going to try to help them too. And it was rattling to their mindset, this, this kind of secular pagan person. They were like, this doesn't make sense. How can you be that loving? Why would you care about them? Well, because the Spirit of God was changing them from the inside out. Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Do you like the book of Joel? Do you like the book of Joel? That's Joel. This is his book. Check it out. He is really freaking old. He just does, he looks like he's, you know, kind of younger, but he's hundreds and hundreds of years old. And I'm really glad that you grew the beard. I should totally have you read this right now. And they recently got married, by the way. Woo! All right, so that's good. Oh, sorry, don't mean it. Yeah. Give them some gifts after the service. Um, Joel chapter 2, verse 28. Then after doing all these things, those things, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your old men will dream dreams and your young men will see visions. That's quoted in the book of Acts after the Holy Spirit of God comes upon the disciples in such a powerful way that people are like, what's going on? Are they drunk? Like, I mean, we don't understand why they love each other like this and what they're saying and how they're speaking in languages they've never learned before and what's going on? And then, the, the preacher right then is like, wait, this is what's going on. This is a fulfillment of what Joel saw and, for, and just kind of foretold. This is beautiful. Amos chapter 5, verses 21 to 24. Away with the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps, but let justice roll on like a river and righteousness like a never-failing stream. It's like, look, you can worship and sing and make music to the Lord and stuff, but the Lord looks at that as important only if our heart is aligned with what God cares about, the things of righteousness and justice. And so even in our own country, when we called ourselves Christians but had so many things going on that were not Christian, we were trying to kind of correct some of those. This was one of the many passages that tried to get us back on that track to say we need to care about the justice for people and care about the oppressed people and the people that can't do for themselves. We need to care about them and just pour out our love for them because that's what God's calling us to into eternity. Micah 6, 8. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. What does the Lord require of you? To act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with your God. Amos chapter 5. All right, so I'm going back and forth. I'm giving you different books of the Bible to show the prophets repeatedly come back to this theme. When you come to your senses in the midst of God's punishment or wrath or state of unforgiveness and lostness. You come to your senses, you repent. You come back on the right track. That you are saved from something to be something different. The full child of God that you were created to be. What's that life look like? Well, 
act justly, love mercy, walk humbly with your God. And then Amos chapter 5, seek good, not evil, that you may live. Then the Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say that he is. It's like, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And we may say that and say that and say that and not even be saved yet. (laughs) And then finally that grace comes on and it comes into us and we realize, wait, we've been saying this is what he is. Now we are going to experience it. The Lord God Almighty will be with you just as you say he is. Hate evil and love good. Maintain justice in the courts. Hate evil, love good. Zechariah, another prophet, same theme. Boy, it's almost like they're all hearing from the same God. Kind of like that, right? Because God's giving that same message. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Administer true justice. Show mercy and compassion to one another. Do not oppress the widow or the fatherless, the foreigner or the poor. Do not plot evil against each other. Now, it's interesting. So we're called to this new way of life. But the bar is high. Like, I don't know if you've noticed, but in our culture, sometimes folks that are really trying to be good, like as good as they can possibly be, get made fun of. If you've seen the show The Simpsons, I'm not saying I watch it ever, but there is a Christian character on there that's supposedly Christian that is not held up as, yay, everybody wants to be like that. You know, he's like the goody two-shoes that everybody makes fun of. Think about that for a second. Have you ever known anybody that maybe... You know, they were really trying to do right, and they got picked on at school. Maybe that was you. (laughs) Maybe you're trying to do the right thing at work, and other people are like, why do you have to be, you know, goody two-shoes? Why why are you trying to be all high and mighty? Why have you got to be like that? Why don't you just do what the rest of us do? Here's how we skimp some time. Here's how we steal a little bit from the the company. Here's how we, you know, just, you know, don't even report that. Don't, you know, whatever. Like, it's tough to live this high moral standard kind of life. That's why the prophets kept saying, like, we're not saying it's easy. (laughs) We're not saying it's all going to go easy and and nice. Like, you're probably going to suffer for it, but it's worth it because that's where God wants us to be forever together. That's the way heaven's going to look, the full justice, the full compassion. So start now on that path and try to be that. Don't try to just say, "Ah, I just want to be a little good here and there, but I'm also cool with not being good, kind of this other evil. No, 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 you got to hate what is evil, cling to what is good. That's actually brilliant. Like, those kind of lives change systems and they change the world. I mean, there are certain changes that have happened, even in our own country, that were unthinkable. Like, how would that ever happen that we would do away with slavery? I mean, just as one example, like, that is crazy. How could we ever get to the point where, where stuff would change that much? How would we ever care about each other like that? In the Middle Ages, so-called Christians were killing each other. And so even today in Europe, some people are like, I don't even know that I want to be a Christian because I don't see that that really changed people's lives. Well, but if you look through the history, there were legitimate Christians that were trying to preach peace and love and compassion for the, for the, the, the downtrodden and stuff like that. The only thing is, a lot of them, from the powerful people, they got mistreated and boiled in oil and crazy stuff. <laughs> like the Amish have a big, thick book about... <laughs> good Christians that horrible things happen to, to remind them, oh yeah, we may suffer for our our faith. It's not just the Amish, it's it's all of us. We realize that. But it's worth it because we have eternal life. The prophets call us to that. So you may say, golly, man, I'm going to have, I need God's help if I'm ever going to live out a righteous life where I really love people like that. Well, yeah, that's the point. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. You think that's a New Testament passage probably. It's actually in the Old Testament. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so the image that I have come back to a few times throughout the years is that image of Jesus reaching down into the water. We're the ones drowning. We may not even realize it. We may not want to admit it. We're drowning, struggling, too enticed with the sinful stuff. Jesus wants to pull us out of that into a new life. A whole lot of people want to be saved from drowning. The number gets a little smaller and a little more narrow when we start breathing that fresh air with Jesus and Jesus is like, okay, now look, all that stuff before, you've got to leave all of it behind. <laughs> I'll walk with you and I'll help you throughout time to try to leave that back there. But you know what? You can't be in love with that old way, the old stuff, the oppression, the selfishness, the greed, the 
stuff you did in the weekend or the behind the scenes, whatever it was. Uh, you got to believe all of that, man, because I'm calling you to a new life of justice, compassion, mercy, love, purity, holiness. That's the story. So when Jesus then was like, look, I know that's a radical transformation. It's so radical that I've got to die and raise from the dead to break the, the, the sin curse on you. That's why the Jews that believed in Jesus got super excited and turned the world upside down. That's, that's next week's message and the message after that and the message after that. That's where we're going in the New Testament. But you've got to understand that Old Testament context. Because then it's like, oh, that's why they were willing to go talk with whoever was in power and say, you want me to shut up about Jesus? Then chop my head off or do whatever because I'm not going to shut up. I'm going to tell people about Jesus because this is radical love of God that changes us from the inside out. Radical love that I need. And I'm going to, you know, you kill me, I'm just going to pop right up someday. I'm going to be raised from the dead because that's what happened to my Savior. That's how powerful that, that message is. I want to pray for us to be able to receive that, believe that, and experience it. God, help us to receive that. Help us to believe that. Help us to experience that this Christmas season. Yeah, it's going to make us weird. (laughs) It's going to make us strange to people that don't buy it or are in love with some measure of evil and are trying to fight with the, the swords of this age. But God, help us to see how beautiful that is to live that other way. Help us to walk in that new way. Give us new life. Help me to be changed more as well. Amen.